Sabah al khair jami'an. Good morning uh, to all of you uh, in the Zoom session and those joining us on the live stream. Welcome to this masterclass, uh, Innovation Driven Startups. This is part of uh, the core at HTU uh, cohort called Core Alpha um, under the support of uh, ISSF uh, and of course under HTU's innovation entrepreneurship uh, activities to the ecosystem. So that's why we are live streaming these events and they are being recorded and can be watched on YouTube as well. Without further ado, yeah, some of you might have heard me say this story before. It's about innovation and the African savanna. So every morning, on the African savanna, there's a lioness, Labu'a. Right? Because the Asad, uh, Asad is lazy and does not hunt. It's the level that hunts. And uh, the lioness thinks today I have to run faster than the slowest gazelle to eat and survive. And then on the same morning, a gazelle wakes up a little bit more nervous, more pressure. Right? And the gazelle thinks today I have to run faster than the slowest gazelle just to survive. Right. So moral of the story is that it really doesn't matter if you are the lioness or the gazelle. When you wake up in the morning, you better be running. Right. So today's session on innovation is not, you know, oh, look at this new shiny thing, you know, called innovation. It might be useful for you. No, we have to innovate. It's not even an option. Okay. So the question is how, how, right? I'm sure in our context, in your professional conversations, we hear, we need to innovate, we need to be creative, but how? So today, although it's an hour and a half session and then we can have some uh, Q and A, if there are any questions uh, that are pressing, please share them on the chat. Uh, Rizit will be uh, coordinating those. If I don't see the chat, Rizit will let me know. But the idea is in an hour and a half, how can we take our thinking from what I call square wheel model, right? And this moves, by the way. Don't think that it moves, doesn't, it gets to where it needs to go, to something faster, more furious, something more attractive, more sexy. What does that look like in your startup? and your organization, right? So the thinking that we're going to be presenting today, the frameworks are applicable to a startup that has you know, three people, uh, or maybe you're just starting out, and it's applicable to corporates, and we have worked with corporates with these models and frameworks very successfully, and I'll share some stories around that as well. So what will we cover? First, we gotta put the business case in. Right, so what is the business case? We're going to look at innovation from an organizational perspective. So what does organizational innovation look like? Then we're going to dive deeper into, okay, what about strategy? Right? What about innovation strategy? How do we manage innovation? Or another way to say it, how do we measure innovation? Finally, you know, some final thoughts and Q&A. So, uh, it, it would be nice if you're going to ask to turn your camera on. That would be kind of beneficial for the benefit of all. If you can't, we fully understand. So don't let that prevent you from asking questions. Uh, you may raise your hand uh, or uh, put the question on the chat. I think that would be more efficient because today is um, it's not a dynamic. You know, we're not in a workshop. This is a you know very very directed a master class around these these topics so there's a lot of information and a lot of knowledge and a lot of questions for you to be asking and thinking so why innovate right that we say change is the only constant well turns out that's wrong change is a variable i really like this curve from deloitte university press because it contextualizes things over the past five decades and it's looking at technology, it's looking at people, it's looking at businesses, and it's looking at 
basically public policy, okay, and government. So what you notice immediately is that there's a lag between these two, two curves, right? This lag is very important because it's an opportunity. Just to kind of contextualize, we talked with the Professor uh, Eduardo uh, a couple of weeks ago on disruption and innovation and digital transformation, right? The whole of digital transformation or digitalization is bringing businesses up to speed with technology. You're not reinventing new technology. You're saying, oh, there's collaborative tools. Oh, I can use open source uh, AWS uh, solutions, right? It's all about that gap, closing that gap. So the gap is an opportunity. The other thing is that this change is exponential. So we talk about exponential technologies. And yes, a lot of us are techies here and anybody can take your, their calculator and look at what an exponential change is like, but it's very hard to fathom, okay? If we take 30 linear steps in our mind, one, two, three, four linear steps, we cover around 30 meters. If we take 30 exponential steps, we go 25 times around the planet. Okay? So the change around us is exponential. We had the coronavirus crash and we're still living these repercussions. I wanna share some shifts that are happening due to the corona crash. Now, one thing to note here to the left is in the first 30 days, the uh, S&P 500, how much uh, value it lost. It's one indication, but also uh, how many days it may take the corona crash to, for us to recover from it, okay? That's not the main point. The main point I'd like to, to say is that if I had come before Corona and I asked you, Hamza, how is, how's life? How's everything? You know, Tur uh, Jalal, how's everything? How's the business? Almost no one would have said, oh, things are just amazing. They're, they're great, right? We're, we've already been living in chaos, right? The coronavirus crash came and waddah. But we've already been living in chaos, right? So what are some of these shifts that are relevant to how we live, but also how we do business, right? So one, business models are accelerating. Yani, right? a business model has a shelf life. It's perishable good. You buy a carton of milk, and you open it and it tells you, you know, use five days before, right? So a business model, your business model, if it's not evolving, then it's going to become expired. But the shelf life has decreased for everybody involved. Automation, digital transformation, talked a lot about that in other master classes. Uh, supply chain, we realized two things here. One, oh my God, how interdependent we are on each other. You know, the butterfly effect, the, the, the guy in Wuhan, China, or in uh, Guangzhou, uh, China, whose factory uh, had to close because he got uh, Corona, let's say, is gonna affect you uh, on the other side of the planet uh, trying to buy uh, a soba for your house, right? It's like butterfly effect, interconnectedness. So supply chain, now there's a lot of opportunities to integrate embedded sensors, blockchain, 5G, IoT. So we create more resilient ecosystem, anti-fragile, multiple points of redundancy. If you have one point of failure and that's your bottleneck, Rahat, right? Mental health, employee engagement are becoming more of a critical issue, right? It's like, and we will talk slightly about that. Social distancing affected a lot of customer journeys, some forever. Think about education, right? The way we're engaging, right? So how did that affect your customer journey? What new opportunities are arising for you? Also, customer expectations and values are changing, right? So, no, but no, no, Taujihi graduate will will accept now a university that does not have an online component. 
It's like, you know, you go buy a car and they tell you, you know, this car has power windows. That's become a point of parity. All cars have power windows now, right? So the expectation and values of customers are changing. The nature of work itself, this is the big debate, you know, work from home, work from anywhere, work from the beach, work in your shorts, work in, in like, right? Changing nature of work. Is it hybrid? Is it, you know, how much hybrid? You know, do we go back? When do we go back? Should everybody go back? We still don't know. Okay. It's an emergent thing. Okay. But work itself is changing. Right? And it's, I see that the, the trend is becoming more about can you get shit done rather than are you in an office for nine hours? Right. So at least that's how I manage my team. Right. Sort of like, I don't care if you're work 60 hours, where are the deliverables? Work six hours and give me the deliverables, I'll be happier. Right. So it's not about, you know, when we talk about entrepreneurship, innovation, and leadership together, uh, and this is a conversation I always kind of engage with Dr. Jalal because I know he manages so many things and he is able to jump from one thing to another. You know, uh, when you are doing that, and as an entrepreneur, you are doing that. You have to do so many things. It's not about, you know, I'm the warrior entrepreneur. Those nights will happen. However, as thought leadership, you need to be thinking, how can I maximize the amount of work not done? Right? How can I maximize the amount of work not done? And this is not laziness. This is cleverness. Okay. Financial services are being disrupted. Needless to say, you know, many things happening there. Uh, Infowars, right? We live in a post-truth world. Thank you, Trump. You know, uh, Infowars, right? Right now, if you think about Corona, for example, everything is being reduced to a narrative. There's either the dominant narrative or the, you know, conspiracy narrative. This is a very complex issue. And people who don't know what a virus even is have an opinion about it. And they'll get on YouTube and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? It actually takes thought and depth to kind of get a handle on anything, right? So that's, that's changing. Also, social values are shifting. So post-COVID, what's going to happen? We need as entrepreneurs, regardless of what's going to happen, to be positioned in a way that leverages opportunity, what can be done rather than saying, you know, right? So innovation, right? Now we can talk about ROI2 or R2I, return on innovation. So why is it innovation important? Well, because companies are realizing that you invest in innovation, you get an ROI. Okay, and that's a way to grow your business. So it requires new ideas, it requires investments, it requires culture. That's where we're gonna kind of talk about today, right? But companies that achieve re good returns on, on their innovation investment, and in your case, your innovation investment is your time, creativity, and willingness to ask better questions. You're not gonna right now put, and in a way, your, your development work is the R&D. But notice something here, right? They say that these are the companies that tend to have a prototype or beta versions out early, and they iterate accordingly, which is everything we've been drilling in terms of, you wanna be an entrepreneur, you know, uh, you need to iterate and validate fast identify your assumptions, run business experiments, iterate. That's the process, right? You can invent a new one if you want for you, but we know that this one produces results because companies big and small are doing that. So check this couple of the, you know, data for the analytics in the, in the, in the house. So 96% of executives, innovation is a strategy, is a priority. Right, but most 
are scrambling to, okay, so 4% only, 4%, the red, they're saying innovation is not a priority. Everybody's saying it's a priority, right? And however, most companies, they have a lack of innovation strategy, right? That's the first thing that, you know, so everybody knows we need to do it, but there's a lack of innovation strategy. Look at this two numbers, 11% and 22%. This is from Booz and Co. So 11% revenue, that's top line, right? Companies that are more innovative, 11% revenue. Now what's telling is the EBITDA, right? Earnings before income tax, depreciation and amortization. That's 22%. So that means that not only are innovative companies growing top line, meaning revenue, they're growing bottom line, meaning profit, which means they are more efficient, okay? So these are the two levers. So it's necessary to innovate. Now I can't help but always bring something in that talks about the bigger picture, right? You know, why is innovation important? Well, what got us here will not take us there. Business as usual is not good enough anymore, okay? We need to rethink. And one way to rethink is to look to nature, right? We are living in a linear material economy. You're part of that. In the way you live, the way you consume, and the way you do business. Now, I know you want to make money, right? And going circular is about making more money because you're more efficient. Right? We are the most, we're running most on a on a isolated context, like you're a business and you're becoming more efficient. You can say, oh yeah, we're 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 being more efficient, but on a macroeconomic scale, we are living in the most inefficient system that you could ever think of. Because we take, make stuff, use it, dispose it, pollute. And there's, a, there's a limit to that. We're not going to go into that. But going circular in your thinking allows you to start closing the open loops. All this is saying is we need to think innovatively to close the open loops and it will make you more money. One way to think about it is to talk about quadruple bottom line. People, planet, profit, purpose. Okay, make profit. Well, no, I'm not saying don't make a profit. You know, uh, put your productive, creative capacity in the marketplace and get rewarded. But, you know, people are important. Planet, purpose are also important. Nutshell to finalize the, the, the business case around, we need to innovate. So being, if everything around us is changing exponentially, take your phone, exponential change, technology is changing exponentially. We need to be agile, adaptive, and regenerative in our thinking and in our mindset. So these are essentials. So what about innovation? Well, it's kind of messy business, right? It's not like, mm, yeah, do one, two, three. It's highly iterative, there's many ways we can look at it. But what does innovation look like in your startup? Right, so let's get more practical now. If you think about it, innovation is a process, same as creativity, and creativity is fuel for innovation. But innovation is more of a structural process because it requires people, resources, right? And it does really one thing, identifies opportunities, for your customers and the organization, right? Enhancements, improvements, and it transforms that into desired solutions, right? So what are these desired solutions? Optimizations, enhancements, services, products, right? So that's innovation. Whatever this black box inside is, it, we change opportunities to delivered value. That's the easiest way to look at innovation from a practical sense. Of course, you need to have capabilities. You need to have the right culture. Right, we're not going to talk about culture today. We're going to talk about the processes and the thinking. Right, but we want to have something called innovation work behavior, or if this is a big organization, we call it entrepreneurial work behavior. And this is going to be key to the 
story that I'm sharing with you today about how do you build for an innovation-driven startup, for an innovation-driven organization, for an innovation-driven university, right? So let's dive deeper a little bit. Let's look at mindset a little bit. One, I always like to share this, uh, you know, the Japanese have a lot of wisdom, right? Uh, the word crisis in Japanese is made of two characters, right? It's pronounced ki ki, right? And the first key is danger, right? It's a like crisis, danger. Like, what do we need to do? COVID, okay, you know, let's plug the holes, stop the bleeding, reduce our expenditure, reduce our costs, you know, there's danger. But then there's opportunity, right? So from the onset, if you are thinking innovatively and you want to adopt an innovation mindset, you need to be thinking that every crisis has an opportunity, right? The other thing is, how do you actually, and this is a high level uh, paradigmatic way of thinking, if you will, because it is not like a tactical strategy. This is like, how do we move forward? You're a captain of a ship. How do you move forward? Well, from management, we know what, what is called command and control right? Command and control. Command and control is like big strategies, you know, get everything under control, measure relentlessly, right? But if I ask you, you know, if the environment around you is changing and, you know, take, for example, riding a bike. When you ride a bike, you're trying to sense and steer. You don't command and control, right? So how do you bring in more sensing and steering, right? Of course, there's a command and control function. Right. Actually, you know, we really don't like this example, but the, the, the U.S. military, right, one of the most, you could say, um, effective in terms of coordination, not in terms of results, a.k.a. Afghanistan. I mean, if you want to look at, you know, uh, do, I, I got this meme. Sorry, I can't help but share this. I got this meme the other day. It's like, if you feel you are useless, and you know, have no purpose in your life. And you know, just remember that it took four presidents, you know, uh, five trillion dollars, twenty years, thousands and thousands of lives to, uh, lost for the U.S. to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. But the U.S. military, which we usually use as a command and control, have stopped using the word control, because. You cannot control a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous unfolding. They use command and coordinate, right? So coordination. And just to those who, who attended the deep dive on the grid, remember that our biggest issue in a business is coordination, not, not competence necessarily, assuming you've got the right people in. So how do you bring in more sensing and steering? Well, customer centricity, I'm getting feedback, getting feedback from, you know, and you adjust course. It's not about the one kilometer step. It's about the one meter step so that you can adjust course. Where can you innovate? You know, so most startups, unfortunately, think that their product is their business, their service is their business. It's not. And your ability to innovate has to span your entire let's say, internal value chain, right? That is configuration, offering, and experience. So configuration, your profit model. You know, how, how are you making money? Network, how are you organizing internally and externally, right? Are you leveraging network effects, for example? Structure, processes, right? Uh, that's configuration. That's behind the stage. Nobody sees that. Okay. So actually, usually it's a great competitive advantage because there's a competitor lag. Competitors can't immediately see, oh, well, I see the output, but what was the process, right? Whereas your product, I mean, that, that's, you know, anybody can buy your product or service for money and experience it, right? So configuration, how you think about your configuration being innovative there has a lot of uh, um, value. For example, Tesla, one of their biggest uh, configuration innovations are is the fact that you always buy direct from Tesla. It's not a wakil. Tesla, Urdon, it's Tesla, right? So they took the middle. That's a structural innovation, right? Challenged. 
Then you've got the offering product performance and product systems. Uh, as you are developing as a startup, you will see that your customers have more problems. So you start iterating on your solution and bringing in new modules, new services, new uh, widgets, depending on what you're doing, and develop product systems. And the experience, you know, service, channel, brand, customer engagement. This is just a quick couple examples, you know, uh, on, on, you know, for example, take Gillette, how we make money. Um, Eduardo, uh, Professor Eduardo from IE and his master class uh, talked about dollar, sh uh, dollar club, uh, dollar shaving club, right? How, how they're making money differently than Gillette, right? So they, they didn't come and say, we have better razors than Gillette. No, they innovated on their configuration structure and their offering, right? Network, Target, for example, you know, Target, in the US, they, they partner with designers and there are products that are designed for Target. Structure, Whole Foods. Whole Foods has one of the best uh, uh, onboarding and hiring process that I've seen, right? It's a democratic process whereby the employees actually make the hiring decisions. Of course, there's structure to that. Process, take Zara. Zara's power uh, is that they can look at uh, haute couture, meaning high-end fashion, you know, uh, Dolce de Gavana, Givenchy, Pierre Cardin, whatever, and they can copy those. You go into Zara, especially, you know, females, men are less aware of what's in fashion, but you're like, oh my God, you know, that's a, a, a Dolce or, a, um, you know, a Versace style, you know, but it's for uh, 60 bucks. So they have a process for that, you know, to take that, you know, it's not just their, their designs. It's the process by which it's like product performance. If you take OXO, these are, this is a company that does ergonomic uh, handles for uh, kitchenware, cutlery, you know, ice creams. Uh, so we recognize it as, yeah, if you want high end stuff, you want to buy a gift, buy an OXO product system. Uh, Cyan is, is, you know, which is, which is a Toyota company, I think, yeah, um, you know, does a lot of, you know, what do you want your car to be, right, to bring in systems for you, for you to merge and mix and match, right, service, Zappos, you know, obsession about customer service, channel, Nespresso, they redefined how we drink coffee, you go to an espresso and you're like, oh, am I in a boutique uh, kind of thing, or is this a coffee place, right, um, brand, how Virgin leveraged their brand from, you know, stores, music store to all the way to Virgin Galactic, you know, now we're in space. Uh, customer engagement, we is an amazing, less talked about uh, kind of uh, example, but I love we, how they, you know, it's not about competing with PlayStation. They carved out a whole different customer segment by being smart, right? So when you think about innovation, don't be married to your products. Think about all these areas where you can innovate, okay? I'll take a, a, a short breath and see if anybody would like to uh, quickly add something or ask something. Uh, Dr. Jalal. Yes, I think I'll the floor, yes. Uh, but SNF, but, uh, is there an approach to major innovation in different levels of companies? Yeah. Because, because you know, everybody's saying that we have innovation in our DNA, you know, but yeah. we, don't see, we don't see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, and I think that's, that's the, 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 the bulk of what I want to discuss today, really. You know? So up to this point, it's sort of like, hey, let's remember what innovation is and isn't. Remember that innovation is a process that translates opportunities to delivered value. This is very important, requires different things. Uh, and then super important, super important, you have multiple areas where you can innovate. And a lot of them will be low cost, low hanging fruit, big impact. So you could have 
you know, Cloud Wizard is in terms of features and, you know, we've already did that benchmark. We know we're better than so many other competitors, right? But so that's done, right? But then can we re-envision the channel? Can we, you know, provide something that is chatbot based on service? Um, can we co-brand, you know? Can we go to some of our clients and say, uh, listen, I want to give you the next year of our product for free in return of uh, a, a cross-branding um, initiative, right? As you go from one to the other, that's where you start saying, how can I be creative and innovative here? Because everybody's always focused on the actual thing. Your business, your startup is not your product or your service. It's a big part of it, but it's not. So, but I will, I will discuss that. So uh, Dr. Jalal, kind of going now a little bit high level, and then we will zoom into strategy and how do you actually envision innovation, how you measure it, right? So I usually like to talk about seven pillars of innovation-driven organizations. But before that, I'd like to remind you that an organization is a bunch of people, or in this case, worker bees, that have a shared vision, shared limitations, resources as well, right? So we need to talk about culture, and this is not the topic of today, but we can't talk innovation without talking about culture, because you can have the shiniest strategies, shiniest processes, but then it's sort of like, you know, you have a, a Ferrari, and then you give it to a 16-year-old that doesn't know how to drive, right? It's people that always deliver the values. So I want to highlight that and we're going to deliver a master class that's specific around culture right but realize that this is a human conversation when you talk innovation it's ultimately about humans to make this a little bit clearer especially from a business perspective we talk about the excx chain if you're talking customer experience great already you know you're in the five percent of people of businesses that are talking customer experience, right? But realize that there's also the EX and it's a chain. So most people, most companies, you either want to increase revenue, top line growth or profitability. We as the core and HTU and, you know, know as who we are, we always like to add impact, impact. It's not enough in today's world to say, you know, yeah, I'm a famous entrepreneur. I need $10 million. Yeah, but the negative externality that you left behind from pollution to disrupted, you know, communities is, is huge. So impact needs to be factored in. But regardless, those are driven by customer loyalty. You have no customers, you have no business, right? Very good. That's driven by customer experience. So that's where we can enhance and think about, you know, pains and opportunities. That's driven by customer service. But behind the scenes, that's where the EX comes in. Employee experience. If you take care of your employees, your employees will take care of your business. Right? So employee withdrawal behavior, employee performance, uh, are these employees actively engaging in what we're going to discuss, innovation work behavior, or are they disengaged and, you know, talking behind your back? You've got engaged, disengaged, and actively disengaged. And in any one company, 100 people, you've got only 30, 30 people engaged. 50 disengaged, and around another uh, 20 that are actively disengaged. They're like, you know, I want to take this ship down, right? So what's the impact of that on your revenue? There is a very strong correlation. So that's why we talk about employee engagement and engagement drivers. That's a different topic because today we're going to talk strategy and tactics and just frameworks. Uh, but that's important. In fact, that's the entry point into the conversation, the people, okay? So that being said, let's talk about these seven pillars, right? These are, if you will, questions, checklists, you know, think of the circle as the center being zero and the, and the uh, perimeter being 10, 
And how well do you feel your organization is in each one? First thing is strategy and leadership. Is there alignment? Unfortunately, it's nice to sometimes think, yeah, you know, innovation, you know, train everybody. If there's no leadership commitment top down first, forget about the innovation conversation. It's nice to say grassroots and, you know, design thinking. And if you don't have top down commitment, clear and actionable, forget about the innovation conversation. Customer centricity. You guys are bored uh, hearing about this, right? So that's important. Do you have the processes and technologies? Is your team engaged? Do you have the right culture, right? Risk-taking culture, a culture that embraces. We said, we don't want to talk about failure anymore. We always want to talk about experimentation. So don't say, let's embrace failure. Let's embrace experimentation. Listen, some experiments will fail. Okay, so do we have that culture? Do we have the resources and agility? And very importantly, do we have the industry knowledge? You've heard loads of examples of a company, you know, there was a trend and they didn't see the trend. And now it's like, oh, where are they now, right? Nokia, Kodak, Netflix, la, 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 right? So that's so super important. If you're, if you're busy perfecting your no-code, low-code, uh, a solution, and then there's an emerging technology that's going to disrupt that. Who cares if it's the best low code solution, if there's something that's going to disrupt it? So these are important. So, with regards to leadership, you know, it's innovation strategies and leadership behaviors, right? It's so important, right? You need to walk the talk. Right? You need to, there's need to be accountability to champion innovation, okay? Uh, when we talk about customer centricity, we talk about insights. Can we generate insights? Processes, you know, how am I measuring? You know, wh what, how am I incentivizing? Engage teams, mindset and behaviors. We're gonna talk about that. Um, I don't know if we discussed uh, with you the importance of psychological safety, uh, but that's going to be covered in a, in a future masterclass. Well, how do you take this risk-taking culture? Okay, let's embrace experimentation. How do you create that? Well, you need to have psychological safety. If you don't, nobody's gonna experiment, simple. If I'm afraid that I'll experiment and fail and I will be reprimanded, I'm not gonna do it resources and agility. Here, I will only say that it's not just about resources, it's about agility of recommitting resources. Think of a, you know, a, a, a big ship in the ocean, right? A, a, you know, thousands of tons of stuff. If you turn the engine off, it will take eight miles to stop. That's not agile. Versus a speedboat. So like, oh, okay, guys, there's this new opportunity. We need, to, we need these resources to commit here. So it's not about resources alone. It's about the agility of committing and recommitting resources. Again, industry knowledge. How much, and I'm going to show you specifically through a case study, how we measure that, right? You know, are we on point with, with direction and stuff? I'm gonna share with you a, a case study of uh, an engagement we did, but I wanna contextualize it in, uh, uh, you are going to innovate. Cool, you know, it's not like, I'm gonna start playing tennis. Yeah, well, are you playing with the uh, entry level guys and you're still learning or are you an amateur or are you a pro, right? So innovation as well, sort of like, oh, we're innovative. Yeah, where are you in the innovation maturity model? Okay, so this is a model that we developed um, as part of, of consulting work that, that uh, we do to help companies become more innovative. And it's four levels. Very simple. You go from novice, apprentice, professional to leader. So novice, I'm the alam, you're learning. Apprentice, you're developing. Professional, you're performing. When you're a leader, now you say, oh, you know, I want to optimize. Okay. So 
from a high level, what does this look like? You will see four, four lines. And there are some slides that I'm including for your benefit. So I'll, as you know, we share the PDFs with you for you to dive deeper. But just to give you an idea around the thinking of how do we get to these levels, right? Uh, the four lines under each level are addressing the same item. So it's just a progressive improvement from one thing to the other. So if we take level one, ability to capture and harness innovation is non-existing. creativity, innovation, ability to harness innovation. It goes from non-existing to marginal, to established, to effective and sustainable, right? Uh, the organization is reactive in its innovation efforts versus it goes to inconsistent, proactive versus consistent. Okay? Tolerance for risk and ambiguity, right? And experimentation goes from very low to low, medium to high. And finally, whether the organization lacks innovation know-how. So a novice level one, they would need to hire, you know, people like me to come and bring in the know-how. So Dr. Jalal, if you want to be innovative, as you mentioned, it has to be in the DNA. So both the consultant's job is to make it relevant and seed, put the seed, and it will grow organically for, and I'll show you how we do that, right? So it goes from Mafi know-how, right? Relies on external know-how or a trusted source within that industry of innovation know-how or produces innovation know-how. Now, going back to this notion of innovation work behavior, and this is super powerful because it changes people's thinking from slogans, take bigger risks, right? To behavior. Why behavior? Well, behavior can be observed. I cannot see the mindset of my employee. I can infer it. I can deduce it by looking at behavior. So behavior is observable. It's measurable. Uh, I can put you know, a process by which I evaluate my team saying, yeah, but how many creative ideas have you put this last quarter? Osama, come on, nothing, man. Yalla, let's I can modify that behavior, incentivize it in a certain way. And it's, uh, it creates a on the same page conversation because we're not talking about ideals or beliefs or values. Those are important, but we're talking about actual behavior and results. So everybody can be on the same side, okay? So again, we said innovation translates opportunities to value. So what is innovation work behavior? There are four things. One is, do you have the motivation and the ability to identify opportunity in the first place, <laughs> right? So it's sort of like, let's all brainstorm. Yeah, about what? What's the question? What are we, what's the frame? So am I looking around to see opportunities? Am I thinking, you know, 10 types of innovation and how can we innovate on our configuration and, you know, identify an opportunity? Then comes, yes, idea generation process. And most companies do it wrong. Won't go into why, right? The brainstorming session. Uh, you know, I, I always say brainstorming sucks because it produces very average ideas. At least the conventional brainstorming. But you do need, now that we frame, now there's an opportunity, how can I generate ideas, right? And you can improve that. If you come up with the million dollar idea and you think that the idea will make itself, you're delusional. Ideas don't make themselves happen. You need champions and championing behaviors. Why? Oh, because this new idea is gonna require us to change this process. We need to add uh, more uh, KPIs to measuring our customer centricity. We need to recommit this resources from here to there. Who's gonna do that championing? Just as a hint, when you look at champions in your organization, these people need to be preferably charismatic and have political influence. Okay, charismatic, 
بيقدر يروح ويحكي ويسوي او تحكي political influence because it doesn't matter what the organizational chart says uh the president the cfo the it doesn't it does matter but what matters is the shadow structure <laughs> like how real work gets done as well and that involves politics right so you need somebody that can politicize can you know bargain can say we need this now and get it done finally implementation execution right so you can talk about typical project management from from that point onward but one of the most important things is that all this needs to happen in a feedback rich environment rich feedback okay so just this slide alone right really internalizing it for yourself four types of behavior might be different for you know the actual behavior may look different for each organization each startup but as a thinking four types of behavior can i am i incentivizing are my people motivated to identify opportunity am i giving them access to the right information is there enough uh, abrasive discussion so that people say no this will not work and somebody says it will work let me show you right am i is there that that motivation to identify opportunity and then you say all right this is a big how might we statement that's where design thinking comes in so how might we so that how might we uh, leverage our brand so that we increase our uh, you know acquisition right and then you generate ideas champion them so each project could have a champion and that creates ownership responsibility and i'll show you now in a in a more formal organization how championing happens i'll show you a very specific example and then implementation okay so let me share this case study with you just to give you an idea of how we go about measuring it you know and how we we think about it so very high level anonymized brief this is a for profit financial services organization in Oman 23 years in business 156 employees and one thing that they 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 they've done is that they acquired uh, another financial services uh, that company that had bigger channels outside Oman and inside Oman so basically they bought you know and now they started thinking you know innovation design blah 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 new ceo you know he was uh, a foreigner like we need to innovate right this is what we did six individual interviews with employee before we talk about so we're not going to come and say oh yeah this is our plug and play solution you know plug it in and you're going to be innovative no we got to be doing deep listening right? assessment we you know uh, uh, this is a human centered approach a design driven approach which produces better results so we did interviews five hours across two focus groups and then we did shadowing you know sort of like okay you're the cfo like what's your day looking like you know i'm just shadowing asking questions and stuff uh hr needed to be completely on board several conversations there three observational days right so it's sort of like what we call in design thinking fly on the wall because you sit with the hr and they have an agenda everybody has an agenda everybody's going to tell you one thing but observation sort of like oh i wonder why they do that like this question to ask right so we did three observation then organization wide uh, um, kind of survey okay so good response rate and there were 44 areas of measurement how did we think about embedding innovation we thought about three tiers right one there was an organizational core innovation team this was cross departmental cross hierarchy so it's not like oh just the c suite cross hierarchy because you need voice of the organization to come in and they are in charge of communicating coordinating right then there was tier 2 once we did the assessment there was tier 2 organization innovation ambassadors team or you could call them champions right that was a champions team and then rest of the organization right so 
you know, giving them certain required training, okay? This is how we framed it. We took just some criteria out with regards to innovation work behavior, but innovation is a process. So you've got innovation inputs and innovation outputs, right? You can't have a process without measuring both, right? So what happens in the middle is innovation work behavior. And we looked at two criteria, right? Two main things. We looked at the organization itself, meaning processes, structures, you know, uh, SOPs, you know, all that stuff, and the team itself. We looked at leadership commitments, right? Remember, strategy and leadership. Innovation strategy, organization's culture, available resources, and organization creative capacity, okay? Team, we looked at participative leadership. Right? It's like, is my voice heard? Is there an opportunity for me to say my opinion? Right? Participative leadership. Customer centricity. External network. How much time does this organize? If you think about network theory and you are a small circle, your organization, you have a lot of inter-network, uh, um, sorry, intra-network connections inside the circle. But what about the outside connections? That gives you an idea of how connected is this company to the actual industry, you know? So external network, job satisfaction, and then team creative capacity. Notice that there's organization creative capacity and team creative capacity. There's a relation and correlation between them. Organizational creative capacity can be equal or less than team creative capacity. Think about it. It can never be higher. Okay? And we'll show you actually the results. High level innovation outputs, customer insights, right? Because we, this organization said we want to be more customer centric. So what insights are coming out? Delivered innovation, incremental, radical, sustaining, and then all the KPIs that you want and KPIs evolve as you're moving through the innovation maturity model. I'll share something with you. So this is what this looked like, right? We did a, a rating, right? And uh, we came up with a scoring from A plus all the way to D. Needless to say, D, you suck. A, you're good. A plus, you're amazing. B, good job. How can this be leveraged? C, where, you know, uh, what are quick wins to move C to B? D, immediate attention, okay? These were the results of this particular, let me show it to you visually, right? So this is the, the organization, right? So you see leadership commitment, innovation strategy was a D. So they're like, yes, I can go and train everybody on design thinking, but who cares? if you don't have an innovation strategy that's clearly communicated, articulated, right? So this helps people uh, and organizations really think what we need to do now to get to where we wanna go. So based on these results, and this is the team, participative leadership was C, customer centricity was not bad, B, just short of an A, cool, what can we do there? External network was very good. Job satisfaction was good. Okay, and then finally, the creative capacity. Look at the team creative capacity, it was a C, because it turns out that they're overworked and they don't know really how to be creative. But then the foundation's creativity is the ability of the foundation to harness team creativity. So again, it was D, right? So these were areas that we kind of looked at. Just to go back here, these were uh, uh, some of the KPIs. Right? So we looked at uh, uh, the ideas contributed in the past three months, uh, change initiatives that you've been part of, change initiatives that you've witnessed. So notice that you know, the, the, the great majority is in the less than three, which is, which is re relevant to the, this uh, particular organization being at an apprentice developing. They understand the leadership is committed, right? Now we're developing, right? So this is a case study that we did 
Again, this was a level two. And what we did basically was we, we did a, a 12 month tiered engagement, right? Where we implemented culture change framed around employee development and engagement. We made this conversation, not about increasing profit, about employee engagement and development. We did the cultural transformation around that and, and customer centricity. We provided multi-level capacity building. We developed a playbook around customer success. They owned it. We didn't say, you know, this is best practice for customer. They developed it, right? So you can see that there's ownership and there's evolution there. We redesigned not a lot, just some processes of onboarding and hiring for cultural fit and incentivizing. So we did what we specifically did. We said, forget about annual reviews. They don't work, right? I mean, the jury is out on this. Okay? If you're in this conversation and you still do yearly performance reviews, you're not doing anything, okay? I do, I do yearly performance reviews and I tell you, it's a headache for me because I don't think that it's the best way to do. So we shifted to quarterly, okay, periodic. Now, if you wanna be developing that, you could say dynamic, right? Your performance is dynamically, you know, we have people, analytics, data, dashboards, pulse surveys, so you can do that. But in the least, do it quarterly, right? Um, and then we incentivize, by the way, the performance review, we incentivize certain behavior based on innovation work behavior. We said, you know, your bonuses are tied to innovation work behavior. Right? And then we implemented a shared dashboard, again, shared, right? That looks at customer insight, unblocks collaboration and innovation. And then we came back 18 months later and we looked at certain key metrics of success of the initiative. Absenteeism was down 33%. Employee turnover, 20%. That's significant because it takes you 25% of an employee's salary to replace that employee. Let's say, meet Alf, but that comes from Ashleen Alf just to replace him or her. Customer net promoter score increased by 25% almost. Customer lifetime value increased. 17%, revenue from new products or services was up 15% and employee engagement was up 43% because that was the central point. So although that KPI is at the end, actually it's holding all these others on top of it. So this stuff works, right? So in the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm gonna walk you through strategy, right? So what does that look like? And what can you do? What questions can you ask, right? Uh, happy to engage in, in further conversation down the line outside the scope of the masterclass. But it turns out that of every million dollars spent on innovation projects worldwide, Harvard Business Reviews, between 700,000 and 900,000 dollars are put in the drain. Efficiency from 30 to 10 percent at best. So why? First, you know, what I call the innovation theater. So yeah, we're innovative. You know, yeah, innovation and, you know, uh, playing the buzz, playing the hype, but there's no strategy. There's no commitment. There's no, 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 no your employees are overworked and you're telling them, you know, come on, be more innovative, right? So we call that innovation theater. And most companies, you know, go into any company now and sit with the CEO, tell them, ask them, you know, uh, is innovation important? Yeah, of course, but it's theater, okay? So innovation theater. Complete strategy disconnect from where the business is and the business objectives. Silos and the not invented here syndrome. Right, and in bigger organization, this happens cross-departmental. So if the sales and marketing comes up with an idea, the engineering is gonna fight it because it's not invented here. That's silo mentality. Disengaged teams, unsupportive culture, lack of data-driven decision-making, you need to sense and steer. Sensing is data. Sensing is data. 
low risk appetite and no experimentation. So how do you expect to innovate? Customer disconnect, there's no market need, you know, building something nobody wants. Long development time, again, that's why we discuss agile. Lack of internal coordination and alignment, okay? Just to name nine, there's other reasons, but these are the most relevant today. So it turns out that 80% of organizations that are innovating run innovation the same way they do other projects. They run operations. So they bring a management perspective and put it on top of innovation and you can't do that, okay? So just food for thought. And then this is interesting. 93% of all companies that ultimately become successful had to abandon their original strategy. You know, we always say, you know, plan A is not gonna work. You know, it's like plan B, right? Because plan A proved not to be viable. And I invite you and everybody listening in who is a startup to realize that there is a 90% chance that you might fail. Maybe it's hard to swallow. But again, innovation, entrepreneurship, building a startup is about de-risking the initiative as much as you can, validating your assumptions as best as you can. You can also not do that and be like, oh, no, I got it figured out. Don't worry. You know, I, I felt the pain. I felt the pain. I know what I'm doing. Nah, 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 nah. And you might fail at 90%. You might win at 10%. But to the degree that you understand that this is an evolving conversation, sensing and steering, you are better off. So just high level strategy is, you know, the option to choose among viable, viable options. Strategy is choosing among options, right? Management is measurement. Management, I'm gonna measure. So strategy is direction, right? How, where will, where will, where will play and win? Uh, and then management is about prioritizing, you know, what, what should we invest in for first, right? Prioritizing, validating, right? So how you manage that. Any good strategy, needs to be reducing the uncertainty as you go down this funnel. So look, bottom, you've got investment or costs. Think money, effort, energy. You That increases. And then the range of uncertainty, your risk, you know, when you go all the way to the top, and you're like, this is how we're going to launch our minimum viable solution you need to be reducing. So any good strategy in any context needs to be reducing the uncertainty cost profile over time, okay? Just high level. So if we look at strategic innovation, one strategy implies future, right? It's like where we are, where we're gonna be. Right? So how are we gonna, where we wanna be tomorrow? There are three types of players in the market, right? The successful innovators, you're a company that are innovating, you know, they have a, uh, uh, and they're customer centric, they're, you know, their risk of disruption is low, right? Then there's the playing catch up. And that's, you know, that's number two is like number one without all the pressure. Hey, let number one open the path, right? And then let me, let me see, right? So, they're not systematically innovating, but at least you're customer centric, you're on the lookout. Hey, you know, everybody's going streaming. Let's also go streaming. Looking the other way. It's like, oh, nothing's happening, man. We're gonna ride this wave, don't worry. Right? Nothing's happening, right? So the higher risk of disruption. There are three and not more innovation challenges that you need to solve. So think about these as problems to be solved. These challenges are whether you're a startup or a established company, they're the same. First is the ideation challenge. Right? Are we spotting, creating innovation opportunities? Balancing long-term and short-term, selecting promising ideas, and then validation, right? Let's validate those ideas. How do we choose among five possible ideas? We want to look at their potential. Avoid investing in, in ideas that 
are not de-risked, right? Then beating the competition, you know, or, or time to market. And then you've got the scale-up challenge. You know, we're in business. We got our series A, series B. Series C is only going to come if you promise a 10X. So that's a scale-up challenge. Different beast, right? So how do you turn on the engines of growth, okay? How do you create the right conditions for growth, okay? So each challenge requires different strategies and framework, right? So this is, this is what this looks like. So it's a process of validating assumptions iteratively. Do we have a problem solution fit, right? Is this problem worth solving? A lot of you are in this uh, stage yet, right? Some of you are in the solution market fit. So sort of like, yeah, I have a solution. You know, customers like it, you know, but uh, we're not sure exactly as to, you know, the best fit with the, with, with the market, right? And then business model fit, right? So look at them, problem solution fit, then solution market fit, then business model fit. Now, these are iterative, okay? So it's not like you just do one and then you, oh, we're done with that. You're working in parallel, but, if you don't have one, if you don't have a problem solution fit, it doesn't matter the other two, right? So they're done in parallel, right? But you need to be working on those iteratively. So ask yourself, am I actually asking these questions? When we think about innovation on the long-term, sustainable innovation, let's say you know, you're, you've launched your company, right? You need to think about the first horizon, which is your core business. I need to expand, improve, enhance my core business. We call that first horizon. And then you need to think about growth business. That's a horizon number two. That's where you're more likely to have longer pipeline and you know, bet on three to five ideas and experiment and move them down the pipeline. And then horizon three, that's future business, transformative innovation, okay? so. And this is good for a startup to think about, but definitely if you're a corporation, you need to be thinking about those three time horizons. So 70% of the value, effort and energy comes from the first horizon. Take care of keeping the lights on. Don't be like, you know, you know we're gonna uh, just cannibalize our business model and go to something completely different. No, keep the lights on. How can we improve that? That's related to the innovation diffusion and S curve, if you remember. So 70%, 20% is the second horizon and 10% is third horizon, as we call these rule of thumb, okay? These are some questions for you to dive deeper, okay? Which technology drivers are likely to drive horizon two and three? Do we have a good understanding of those? And a couple of questions to just guide your thinking. This is what we've been trying to integrate into the core alpha program, which is the frameworks. Like, okay, what, what tools do I use? Well, you've got customer problem, customer solution, and then growth and scale, right? Design thinking is not a solution for everything, and it's not suitable for every situation, but it is great as you're starting to you understand your customer, build that DNA, you know? So design thinking, you know, that's, you're exploring the problem. Lean is about build the right things right. Build the right things, sorry. So lean is, is iterative, already are aware of that. And then agile is more, now you're running. Now you're running, now you're an organization and you do your sprints and that's where your technology roadmap come. And then the go-to-market, I'm using go-to-market here, not as, just go to market strategy, but as an engine for growth. So I go, okay, go to market, right? So these are different frameworks, depending on where you are and what you're trying to do, you have to use. There's no one size fit all. It's like design thinking for everything, it doesn't work. But if you're not doing design thinking in the early stages of, you know, a, a problem uh, uh, solution fit, then you're not doing it right, right? So, these are frameworks that you're aware of, you know, and notice that they are iterative and cyclical. So I've included these for your uh, benefit. But all this process is about validating assumptions iteratively. Diverge, create choices, criteria, make choices, converge, and keep doing it. 
So this whole thing is, you know, and as you're moving, you're doing less design thinking when you launch. More lean startup. Now your operation, you're doing a lot more agile and just go to market. And then maybe three years later, you're like, you know, there's another problem we're going to solve. Let's bring design thinking back into the game. Okay, so this is a toolbox. It's a toolbox. You open a toolbox and you see what tools are relevant to what problem. So super important. To come up with an MVP, right? That's what we're all doing, right? I like the word solution better because product means one thing and service, you know, but solution, you're, you're developing a solution. So no brainer uh, here with regards to, of course, I'm assuming that this masterclass assumes certain uh, knowledge. That's why I'm referring to things. Uh, it's an advanced look at innovation, not an intro. So yes, to deliver a minimum viable solution. What are the three key strategic questions you need to ask? How to incorporate innovation, how to govern innovation, and how to fund innovation, okay? So we're gonna talk about corporate innovation metrics, innovation growth board, and metered funding. First, let's take a, a deep look on this, you know, corporate innovation matrix, right? Most probably, as a startup, you are in the first little thing, right? Look, so you've got innovation stage from IDA developed to scale, right? And then you've got innovation source, internal, hybrid, or external. Okay, so let's walk one by one. So internal means internal to the organization. That's most definitely where you are. But then can you collaborate with an adjacent startup or you know, to bring in some hybrid? I don't know. That's available to you. Or external, you know, hackathons, bring in a consultant, do an innovation uh, workshop or a design thinking workshop, right? And then which stage? So there's something called R&D, innovation lab, st still internal, and then product innovation as you're scaling. You have a product, you've got your minimum viable solution. Now we're making it super, okay, through innovation. Hybrid, we can talk about platforms or having a venture studio. Sort of, sort of like, well, you know, we're using open source to build our solution. And, you know, there's other people that use open source. Let's put some of our resources with their resources and do a venture studio to develop ideas that can help us both. Collaboration. Collaborate. Collaborate. The degree you collaborate, think about network effect. Metcalf's law. Network effect, the power and value of a network is a power distribution. So it goes directly proportional to the power of the people on the network. Okay, so you're a startup and you're a network. How many networks do you have that are relevant? So collaborating like that could be a source of innovation. Having partnerships. So Okay, GitHub, listen, you know, I want a partnership with you. Why not? All right? Um, then external, you've got the hackathons and accelerators. You hear about those all the time. Sort of like the Bank Al Arabi, you know, uh, is doing a hackathon. Come and we will we will fund you. Why are they doing that? One, they don't know. In, they don't have yet a fully developed innovation DNA. Right? They're working on it. They're getting there. Two, it's cheap. <laughs> so what? I'm gonna give each startup five grand, ten grand to solve a problem for me. So it could be easy. Or an external venture capital or merger, M&A and D. Merger and acquisition, sort of like you're a big company and uh, uh, you know, instead of reinventing the wheel, you go and buy, acquire. Right? That's why Talabat acquires, you know, that's why Uber came in and Kareem came in and acquired these companies. It's like why that's called a merger and acquisition. And D is divestiture. So, Uber, for example, they went into autonomous driving and to acquire that technology because they're like, oh, it's going to be autonomous driving. We're not going to need any drivers anymore. Turns out that's a 10 year scale time frame at least. So they sold it out. That's called divestiture. Okay. So where are you in that mix? This is just to give you an idea, right? How do you govern innovation? Right. How do you innovate fast, cheap, and systematically, right? Like VCs do. 
So the same concept as innovation team, innovation ambassadors champion, think of the growth board. Now I'm talking about systemic innovation, not isolated innovation. Now this is an organization, it's in the DNA. What does a growth board do? It's got its own strategy, metrics. It's cross-functional, cross-hierarchical, very important. Because a lot of people say, you know, yeah, this is the middle management, you know, crew right? Uh, the in-group. This is the C-suite C conversation here. No, C-suite right? Innovation board. You need those feelers from everywhere in the organization. So what are some of the characteristics of this board? Oh, this shit's cross-functional. It's focused on delivering business value. It reflects, we said leadership strategy and alignment. It reflects the appropriate business owners on the top and the top management, it reflects those priorities, right? But engages the entire organization. It has a budget and a resource mandate, okay? Use data to make a pivot or preserve decisions. So now you have a team of 100. That's where you wanna go. No, you're a startup that you wanna scale. All right, so you're gonna have a lot of creativity and a lot of ideas. And you're going to vet those ideas and push them down the pipeline. And I'll show you how we do that in a way that de-risks, right? Your, your main thing is going to be either pivot, preserve, or ditch, right? And I'll show you how that's done. It enables and encourages top-down and bottom-up collaboration, is not siloed, okay? It's focused on status updates, and it's not a traditional command and control, okay? Very important. And it, like, it acts like a venture capitalist, or although I'll say that with a caveat, because a venture capitalist says, this is a numbers game. I'm going to make 20 bets, and two of these bets are going to bring me all my money. I really couldn't care less about the 18 startups I invested in. Remember, you know, you're a number for the, for the investor. So that's the inv venture capitalist approach, you know? Let's invest in 10 companies. One will be a unicorn. We're good. Right? Internally, you can't do that because you can't waste money. So it's kind of like a venture capitalist, but not really. This is how the idea growth board works. And you can be a single person growth board initially. Right? So there's an idea and pitch, growth board, you validate experiments. Show me experiments, validate those experiments. You're saying one, two, three, validate them, right? And then, you know, either we're doubling down, let's go, man, this is great, great results, pivot or preserve or discontinue, right? It's a very simple, but very powerful approach to do that. Now, how do you fund? So the growth board has a budget, allocated budget. In most companies, what happens is you say, yeah, 10% of our revenue is going to R&D and that's gonna be the innovation. You know? So now you have a mandated budget and different departments ask for a budget, so it's allocated. So that's traditional funding, right? Infrequent, usually annual budgeting process, central decision-making. That's not entrepreneurship. That's not innovation. That's not agile. That's old school. So what is metered funding? Metered funding assumes that the amount of resources as you push an idea forward is gonna increase and your investment's gonna increase. Your return on investment should be increasing. That's how you de-risk. Visually, this looks like this, right? So you've got very low prototyping and experimentation, do 10, and you've got failed prototypes, great. We're not gonna go down that direction. And then you push some ideas down the pipeline. You're like, okay, you, 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 into the next stage, right? More prototyping, more experimentation. And here's a little bit more money. Okay, that's metered funding. Then you say, wow, okay. So out of those five, we have two that we kind of like. You get more funding. So. Allocating funding over a series, just like a VC. You know, why does a VC say, yeah, pre seed angel, friends, family, and fools, uh, uh, angels, pre seed, seed, la la la, right? 
because at each stage, you're trying to read the risk. So it is actually a metered funding. What you need to be a unicorn is not the initial 200,000 that you got. It's going to be a series of funding, right? So this de-risks the, the process. And you put milestones instead of a department saying, yeah, you know, we need 50,000 for our R&D. No, I'll give you 5,000 for each viable experiment that you want to run. And each subsequent stage, you prove to me that this is going to work. All right, I'm going to double down on you. I'm going to give you 15,000 for four ideas. See how that de-risks? So funding is based on milestones and goals. And in the early stages, the funding is learning. <laughs> You're spending, you go take a course, you invest in yourself to learn. So initially, the 10 ideas and the failed prototypes, you put a budget of $500. Can you come up with $500 ideas to vet this? You're learning. And then in later stages, funding becomes growth-based. Okay. So again, this is what this looks like. Project initiation, growth board. So you pivot, preserve, or discontinue and you go on forward. I'm gonna have to cut short Shui innovation measurement, but I'll give you the slides and give you an idea of um, how to go about this. You do need KPIs, even if you're a one-man show. You do need KPIs, right? It allows you to assess the effectiveness of your, your, your input. Now, we always say what's, what's not measured can't be improved, right? But there's something even more important. Not everything that can be counted counts. We're like a dashboard galore. Why are you measuring all this stuff? I don't need it. Data should be giving me insight how to sense and steer. So not everything that you can count counts, but also not everything that counts can be counted your employee engagement. It's not a simple equation, right? A brand uh, image, right? Going back to the grid, there's a lot of things there that need to be measured, but they're qualitative, right? So this is, this is paramount. So we have a system, right? Input and output, right? Input metrics are great to start innovate, measuring innovation because they are responsive. Right? So when you're measuring input, you're able to react to changes sooner. You know, we call these lead KPIs versus an output. It's a lag KPI. I have to wait for it to come out the other side. Okay. So just some ideas. Okay. And then output metrics may become inputs. Again, innovation maturity. Now I just want to measure, uh, uh, you know, number of ideas my team uh, presents. Right. And that's an output. In two years or in a year, that becomes an input. And what I'm looking at is revenue growth from new ideas. Right? So even this is a, is a conversation. And again, what you want to do, we've got the ideation, validation, and growth and impact challenges. Three challenges, we said. Right? So level of uncertainty is going down as you go. So think about that and how you would do the KPIs accordingly. So the input is the I and the ROI, and the, the output is the, is the R, okay? So the return, right? Some examples, right? R&D expenditure, number of innovation projects started, innovation training, right? Number of ideas passing through the pipeline, output examples, number of new products launched in X amount of time, revenue, over, revenue or profit growth from new products, ROI or R2I, return on innovation actual versus targeted break even time for new products now as you're evolving you start you can go a step closer or step up and say all right you know input output that's efficiency so you can develop a corporate innovation index right by dividing your 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 output by your input okay uh, your input by your output Okay, so this may look like this. 
Again, just an example for different stages. And this is for you to kind of dive deeper. You know, we're looking at different areas, capabilities, structures, culture, strategy, business, and product. You've got input and you've got output, okay? So uh, just to name a few, for example, here in uh, business and product, uh, an input could be number of new products launched, number of new patents acquired or uh, and then output could be revenue from new products, product market fit for new initiatives, growth rate for new products, actual versus expected break-even point. To take another example for, for example, culture, number of inputs, number of new ideas and initiatives coming straight from employees versus coming from management. Interesting. Time spent on development versus operation by all levels. Output, employee participation, employee score for innovativeness, overall engagement score, number of employees trained in innovation methodologies. Right? So this is just a deeper dive for you. And final thoughts, uh, just to kind of wrap everything together. And I know it's a lot, right? But uh, the reason why these master classes are condensed is because we want you to see the horizon and then you can go and kind of focus or engage with us you know you can uh, book coaching sessions on demand um, to dive deeper but the idea is to give you uh, uh, the fluency of thinking so that you know you're not just using innovation as a buzzword be specific with what you mean by it and what it requires to actually be innovative so some tips for choosing met metrics, focus on a few metrics at a time. Don't get excited because then you don't know what's happening. Right? So I'm going to measure these couple of things for the next quarter and then see, add, discontinue. Find a good balance between the metrics and prioritize them. Assess the life cycle of the innovation. So look at met metrics in terms of, you know, what are, what's the overall story and process here from end to finish that I'm trying to do? Uh, don't force the same metrics for everyone in the organization. So R&D department is going to get different metrics than sales. But have metrics that contributes to your innovation, innovativeness. Finally, you know, research is clear. Innovation requires passionate discussion, debate, and even conflict. Okay? So this is a people conversation. So most often with people with diverse perspectives. So we're gonna talk about high performance teams in a later um, masterclass and we can discuss that. But pick your focus and innovation mix. So, so say what you wanna do, okay? We're focusing on uh, uh, one, perfecting our product and we want 70% to be there. And then 30%, that's our strategy, to look at potential opportunities with configuration and experience. Right? And make that clear, right? And our end game now, we don't want to disrupt the market. We want to get, keep the lights on and we want to hit these revenue growths specific, right? Align your strategy with your business goals. It needs to be one story. Share your strategy openly. I know it's counterintuitive. or like, you know, this is my work. It's my strategic thinking. Share the strategy openly. You generate engagement and hey, you're going to get more people telling you but why and how and adding value. Ownership, right? So share it. Communicate uh, uh, what you want. I just mentioned that. And the ways of working. Measure and adapt. Okay. Feedback rich. So unblock. Anytime you can unblock uh, uh, communication, unblock it. Anytime there's an open loop, close it. Just as a general thinking, right? Systems thinking. Rethink risk. There is something called ROI or R2I, return on innovation and return on investment, but there's also something called COI, the cost of you not doing anything, the cost of inaction, right? Foster diversity and creative abrasion, right? If you're in a team and everybody just says yes to you, your team sucks. If you're in a team and everybody agrees always with everybody and you're like, we're the most harmonious team, Maybe your team is good at delivering management and, you know, kind of like Six Sigma, but it's not going to be 
an innovative team. So foster diversity and healthy creative abrasion. Start with mindset, think skill set and tool set, equip people with the resources and focus on behavior, innovation, work, behavior. With that, um, exactly on the hour from when we started, hour and a half, sorry. Uh, thank you and um, happy to stay longer for any afterthoughts, uh, engagements and uh, questions. We have a couple of questions. Uh, Dr. Jalal, uh, can you please elaborate more about network theory and design thinking? So uh, uh, network theory is, is the idea, at least how it's used in the innovation ecosystem. And for example, an investor might tell you, you know, yeah, but you're not leveraging network effects well. The idea of, of network theory is that you've got nodes and entities and you've got connections with those, with those entities and those connections have a value, right? Because not every connection, not every communication has the same value, right? But in general, it says that the power and value of a network increases to the square of the people on the network. So your social network, it's like, and there's you and five of your friends, like, all right, think again. So that's why a company like Twitter can, you know, survive and get keeps getting funding and increased valuation, even though they're not making money because there's growth. Same thing with Uber. The value of the network is growing, 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 right? So that's, that's network theory. Uh, design thinking is, is different. I mean, we've, uh, we've covered design thinking um, through different deep dives and, and, and master classes, but it's, it's design thinking is looking at whatever problem you're solving as a set of assumptions. And, you know, I would add human design thinking because people have these, these problems and, and validating those assumptions in non-conventional, non-linear ways. Um, Thank you, Doctor. We have another question. How can we manage culture fit and innovation mindset when you're expanding the team? Well, you need to understand, you know, uh, first, before you expand the team, is the team actually, so ask this to your, to your team. Ask this question to your team. Right. Is your team Aslan aligned? And, you know, your, so discussion, and sometimes we think, you know, it's like, oh, you know, some guru is going to tell me some magic strategy and I can give you tips and tricks. But sometimes just an honest, authentic human conversation sort of like, guys, you know, what is our cultural fit here? You know, are we innovative enough? That is if you're expanding this team. If you're building the team, then you have to think competence, trust, and cultural fit, all three. The Marines, the Marines are high performance people, you, you would think, right? Well, people in the Marines like to recruit people into their teams that don't have such a high performance and low trust. They rather somebody with high trust and somehow a little bit low performance, okay? So it's not just about competence, it's about cultural fit. There's, there's a lot of things, uh, Batul, that uh, uh, we can explore with regards to cultural fit um, because culture is, you know, a big, broad uh, conversation. I could uh, engage with you separately on that uh, at a later point. Thank you, Dr. Yazan. Uh, Dr. Jalal Andu has another question. Yes, please. Uh, I will you, Dr. Yazan. Yani amazing as always. El, uh, uh, Doctor, you already said it. You you have already helped a lot of organizations to improve their you know entrepreneurship and innovation strategies and and implementation. So, from your your observation, what the uh, I would say the common challenges in our region to implement uh, innovation that you have observed and witnessed. This is the first question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for for, for that. Um, you know, we have around like more, more than 30 like big clients and a lot of smaller clients. And we do notice that there's a difference between big clients and small clients. One small clients, um, 
believe that, you know, uh, this is like, a, you know, I'm going to press a button and innovation is just going to start happening. Okay. And they rely on, on external, uh, you know, consultants and, you know, and we go in and we tell them, we're not going to be the gurus that are going to build this. You are. You know, we are here with you so that you don't need us, right? Uh, so, so again, thinking that some sort of best practice and some sort of technology may solve the problem is one big issue, and more so in, in, in more smaller companies. More mature companies understand change and uh, change takes time and change initiatives fail and culture is difficult and uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So they're, they are willing to engage with you on a longer term. But again, if you don't have, you know, if we go in and they send us to the HR director, which we need to sit with and, you know, and sort of like, yeah, this is an HR thing. We're not going to play with you. <laughs> Because I need C-suite commitment. I need. Does the board know? Does the board know that you are want to be innovative? Does the board agree? Don't throw this on the on the door of the HR department. It's an everyone work, not HR work. And then uh, the the last thing that you know, these are companies that will not anyways call us <laughs> because you know that's the innovation theater. So yeah, you know, we did this and we did that. Show me three experiments that you did last year that failed. Show me percentage change in your revenue and new products launch, right? Give me numbers, don't give me slogans, right? So we call that innovation theater. And then the rest is sort of like the hype, sort of like no understanding what innovation really is, sort of like, yeah, you know, everybody's singing innovation. Well, I'll sing along too. So those maybe three, four things. واضح دكتور اذا تسمح لي كمان سؤال دكتور ال ال تدي ان ذا جفرمنت سيكتور يو نو ان ان ذا تراديشنال سيكتورز يو نو ذي فيل سيف تو نوت امبلمنت انوفيشن سو ذات موست اوف ذا امبلويز ليف ان ذير كومفورت زون اند ذي دو نوت وونت يو نو اند ذي دونت ذي فيل ذات ذي دونت نيد تو تو امبروف يو نو سو وات واز يو وود سي فور فور ذوز بيبول تو يو نو to encourage them or motivate them to implement entrepreneurship spirit and innovation spirit, even if it's not implemented in the culture or it's not a strategic you know, uh, goal from the top management? Number one, make it about them. <laughs> uh, say it again, please. Yeah. Number one, make it about them. OK. Yeah. okay. Because you're a government employee getting 500 JDs a month can barely, you know, you know, and your uh, task, you know, to be more creative and innovative. By the way, you're touching on a point that's very important that a lot of governmental organizations are funding innovation, entrepreneurship, you become innovative first. Yeah, so that's uh, that's one. When you make about, about them and their development, you you get the necessary commitment and accountability because you need to have accountability and commitment. Another thing is understand that any change, anytime you're asking somebody to change, حتى لو it makes sense rationally, wow, you know, and why wouldn't anybody do it? Well, because change is tough. Think about one habit that you have that you would like to change. Is it very easy? No. So making it more human and saying, listen, guys, you know, we know we're asking you to use now Salesforce where you were using Excel, right? You know, and this is going to be disruptive for you, but we understand your frustration and we are here to support your confusion and you know maybe your performance is going to go down that's okay we're here to help you make that transition which will be for you and for everybody else better so frame the destination and the promise the transformation make it about them and understand because it's so easy to say if you think that people are just going to say Yay, yalla, disrupt the way I work. No. 
So resistance to change, and you take a vaccine that leverages your immune system. It fights against it. They need to suppress the immune system because the immune system naturally says, no, foreign, change, I don't know, confusion. So anything that you want to change, address the human condition and concept, and no, it's normal. It's natural for people to resist change. responsibility على leader to bring them in and then you address their confusion. يعني أي مرة بده يصير في تشينج إن الشتب لازم يجي السي أو ألف مرة ومرتين ومئة مرة يحكي guys we know this is going to be difficult علينا وعليكم معاكم للموت نحن يلا you know uh, so that's what I would do and one thing I would say you know maybe not directly to your question but we think about the public sector as in uh, let the private sector innovate I disagree with that if you think about the Apollo project if you even think about the, the fast iteration of vaccines, hello, okay? If you think about uh, uh, most technologies from DARPA, the Latin World Wide Web, to, you know, uh, GPS, to all these things were government-funded projects. Mm -hmm. So I am increasingly weary to just say, let the private sector innovate. Private sector, then, ما بهمه وما عم بفكر overall social society civilization marginalized community. Private sector عم فكر حبيبي أنا بدي أحط أستثمر مية ألف بدي أعملها عشرة مليون علي وعلى أدائي مش فارقة معي. Externalized negativities. Governments لا. ف in my thinking, it's changing. I want to let, raise the bar شوي, for governments because co governments have money that they can spend without expend, expecting an ROI because their mm -hmm. ROI is different. Their ROI is, you know, level of digitalization, digital transformation. In my employees, يروح, il, 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 you know, customer service boot camp for everybody. Right? Uh, I see that, you know, governments... Uh, need to, uh, you know, lead the way a little bit more with regards to uh, innovation and not just say, نحن رح ندعبكم يا قطاع خاص نحن الحكومة ما ما بنبتكر ليش ما بتتك كل الابتكارات إجت من الحكومة right so uh, and not to say that we're not particularly in Jordan uh, Moody's doing a good job changing the direction and uh, leading initiatives we've engaged with them as HTU to to work on uh, uh, several uh, design thinking uh, workshops. Uh, for there is that change, but I think governments can do a lot more uh, than they think they can and should. Amazing. Thank Dr. you, Dr. Uh, Abir and her question, Dr. Abir, mm -hmm. please go ahead. No, thank you, Dr. Yatik al Afia. Uh, I'm going to ask you to ask me to احنا بالنسبه لنا الستارت اب لازم نبلش بالاول نحدد الانوفيشن تايب اللي بدنا نمشي فيه صح؟ واللي بناء عليه رح نحدد المتريك الانسب تو ميجر البرفورمانس تبعت الانوفيشن تبعتنا من خلال اكسبيرمنتيشن وبنش ماركينج لناس بيشبهونا او بالاندستري او مشوا بنفس الباث تبعنا بس هاي البروسيس برضه بيجوز بحاجه لريفرنسز او آه يعني آه مكان ممكن نعرف فيه هاي التفاصيل فكنت بدي اسال الريفرنسز اللي انت يعني بتقترحها لهذا الباك غير انه احنا اكيد لازم نقعد ونشوف السوليوشن اللي احنا في بالنا اللي احنا عم نشتغل عليه ايش التايب اوف انوفيشن اللي انسب له يا فايش الريسورسز اللي لازم ناخذها يعني از ا رول اوف ثم كل شيء حكيتي صح بس يو ليفت اوت سمثينج موست امبورتنت بيكوز وي ونت to the structure and the processes and measure and experiment, which يعني, you are doing as, as Abir and as Larry Moore, that's what you're doing, right? You're, you know, and your, your, as a rule of thumb, your, your uh, first innovation needs to be around the product and how you 
create and put the resources to deliver the product configuration and the experience. That's, you know, so that spectrum, let's say, that's where you innovate. Right, but your center of gravity is is your is your solution, minimum viable solution first, and then you iterate on it. Right, you're not going to be, you don't have money, you don't have resources, you're not going to be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to use uh, generative adversarial networks uh, to, the, you know, these are the things that they use in deep fakes to disrupt and create something new, which is a horizon three. You need to fo focus on horizon one. What's going to get you money? What's going to get you money? And then, yes, you need to, and it, it doesn't have to be so like rocket science, right? So when I say focus, you know, what is your innovation strategy, Will? Our innovation strategy is to uh, validate our, uh, you know, solution uh, problem, right? Problem solution fit, solution market fit, and business model fit, and work on these. Focused on on these. Maybe you're done with the problem, solution fit, right? The the last thing in your team is you want to say and give maybe an onboarding, uh, you know, or watch this masterclass again with your team and say we want innovation work behavior, because when the high strategy you measure KPIs, are you behaving in a way that produces innovation? Are you, are you identifying and are you providing resources for your employees, your team to identify opportunities? Maybe yes, maybe you're not doing a good job, maybe you're doing amazing work, right? Idea generation, right? Exploring different tools and ideas of how do you do brainstorming? Yeah. Championing and then implementation. So I, IWB, innovation work behavior, is even more important than just saying, you know, that's our innovation mix and strategy because that's just direction, right? And then management, simple KPIs to say, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you uh, for your, your time and uh, for your questions. Uh, if you joined in, in the middle, you can you can watch the early recording. This is a, a masterclass that re really is designed to expand and upgrade your thinking, whether in your current startup or whatever else you do, because innovation is not going anywhere, you know. So better be fluent about it and ask the right questions and, and help those around you understand it better and contextualize it and think about, you know, the tactical, practical, how do you make it actually the rubber meet the road and uh, move forward. So thank you all. And if there are no other questions, that would be a wrap for uh, today's masterclass. Thank you.